welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I hope you had a good stretch break. Um, we're having our next uh, story selling, telling session with Marlene and I will be your mo moderator. I'm Shoshana Mossdaller. Um, so now I'd like to ask Marlene to join me. Can you hear? Okay, hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for agreeing to share your story. It's wonderful to see you. Um, so I'm honestly just going to jump right in um, with, would you just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're doing now? Yeah, so um, I'm currently working as a um, child therapist. I work with um, children ages four to 18. Um, I work in a mental health field right now. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. I'm actually working on obtaining my license, my um, LCSW. So that's where I'm currently at right now, working on that. That's fantastic. I love that. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey leading to where you are now? So a little bit about what led to your homelessness. Yeah. Um, it wasn't just one thing. It, it, it started off with, I had gotten um, really sick, blood pressure had, you know, and I had to go to the hospital. Um, I was sick for a while. I took some time off of work and it was like a mixture of things. I was sick. When I took the time off, I didn't have the, the backup plan. Like I didn't have any extra funds. I didn't have um, the insurance and things like that. So it was like, I didn't have me being out of work. I was out. Um, I didn't have the money, the financial, you know, and then I actually um, got evicted. Um, and then, like I said, it was multiple things, just like, it just like was one after the other, one after the other. Then I had where I, I wouldn't necessarily say this for a client, but I had a, like a meltdown. It was just like, everything kept going. And I, it was hard for me to contain, like to be positive, um, because it, it was just multiple things. It was like one, it was like a domino effect one after the other. So it wasn't like one thing it was a mixture of things that was going on with me. No, that is, I think, something that we hear quite a bit. Um, so tell us a little bit about Zena. <laughs> so Zena's my baby. Um, <laughs> she's my second child. <laughs> um, she's a three-year-old um, pit mix. Um, she's like the biggest baby ever. She is really sassy and she's really spoiled. So she wants it her way. Um, Zena is like, you know, my, I said before my person, cause she is, you know, like right now, even getting back to um, trying to get back to where I was, you know, it's Zena there. And it's like, sometimes I just have, I have a down day and like, you know, Zena won't let me just lay there and sleep and do that. You know, she's like, Hey, we're going to take a walk, you know, she takes my hand and, you know, we're out there walking. So Zena is, um, she's great. <laughs> um, yeah, she's great. Um, so I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about trying to find housing with Zena. Zena is a pit mix, as I think you mentioned before. Um, and I know that that can be even more of a struggle. So can you tell us a little bit about the things you tried and what, what worked, what didn't work, that kind of thing? Yeah. So I looked all over. So it was actually me and my daughter. Uh, we looked all different places because we were going to get a place together and we tried different places, but they had that restriction, that breed restriction on. So it was difficult. We, you know, different places we wanted to go, they had that breed restriction. Um, then the places that didn't have it, they were like so high, you know, the pricing was like so high, um, you know, that what they were asking. So it was just like, it was difficult to find that, you know, because, and I just wanted like people just, can you just meet her? Like, you know, and see, you know, that's, that's not all, you know, Pitbulls, you know, they have this bad name. I get that, but that's not her at all. You know, like she's scared of you. She's scared of people. <laughs> and it was, it was just that, you know, it was difficult to find. And then some places don't allow dogs at all, you know? So it, it went to where I think that was one of those things where I kind of gave up on that too, you know, because I was like, what's the point? You know, I couldn't find anything. Then it was like certain neighborhoods that I didn't really feel comfortable with that where I probably could have went. And I was like, I just don't feel comfortable there. Um, I have to walk her and things like that. And I wasn't, you know, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. 
So it was it was it was a it was a hassle trying to you know find places um, for her. Um, you know, it even got to where I did have a place, and even I stayed with a friend. And the problem with that was um, the friend didn't want Zena in the house. Zena is not an outside dog at all. She would cry. You know, she couldn't be. She didn't want to be out there. And that would like hurt me. It made me like feel, I felt everything, hearing her whine, you know, things like that. Couldn't block it out. It was just a lot, you know. Um, so yeah, we went through a time. <laughs> we went through some stuff. No, I, I love, I'm, I appreciate you sharing that, you know, because I know Zena was in our program twice. And the first time she went home and she was with you, but she was in a, in a situation that yeah. you didn't love but we knew it was temporary, which right. is what we're talking about when she had to be out outside yeah. temporarily. And you were, you know, making sure you were staying outside with her a lot, yeah. you know, making her comfortable as, as you could until you got into your new place. But then at one point, and I would just like you to talk to how this whole process made you feel. At one point, I know you called us from an animal control facility because you had reached, you didn't know that it was she, if she could come back into our program. Right. And you kind of called me a little bit in a panic. And I would just love for you to talk a little bit about that experience of really just not knowing what you were going to do and, and how that worked out. So it got to the point where I end up having to leave the friend's house. Um, it was, I'm going to be very open with you guys. It was like a, a lot of verbal abuse and stuff going on there. And I had to go. Um, I left, but yeah, it's easy for me to leave. I can just go. I got friends, you know, I stay here, stay there, but I didn't have anywhere for Xena. And I, I did post her on different sites, but even with that, they didn't seem, I was worried because the, some of the people that would call, you know, the things they would say, I'm like, wait a minute, you know, are they going to try to fight her? I was so worried. You know, I couldn't trust anyone, you know? Um, so then it got to where I, I kept looking, kept looking, but my daughter was getting calls. I was getting calls, but the, you know, they weren't, I didn't feel comfortable from, with the people that wanted her. So I did go to surrender her. I didn't know what else to do. And I didn't think I would take it as hard as I did. You know, I'm taking her and I told my daughter and it was like really sad. And she was like, can you bring her over here? Can you bring her over here to, for me to see her? And me, her, and my daughter, we hung out and, you know, Zena was just being Zena and she was all happy and playing. And it was just like, she doesn't know what, you know, I got to go, but she has to go. So we finally got there and I talked to them and I talked to my daughter and she said, she's looking around because she didn't want her to go. She called her friend, friend said, Hey, you know, he can watch her. Um, somehow got a hold of her friend. He was military guy and was able to, when he came out of deployment, he was going to let Zena stay. Um, so I was like, okay, wait a minute. I just have to find some place for her. <laughs> so I, I, I reached out. I, I thought you were going to say no. Um, I was worried, but I said, you know what? It's not a no until you call and see, you know, and I called and, and you, you, you did, you looked, you know, you, you, you were able to take her in, you know, I was so grateful for that. Um, and she stayed there for like a night because um, I believe you guys had some stuff going on with the room and I went and got her next, you know, day and brought her. And during that time, you know, I know her friend was going to take him, but take her, excuse me. But I was like, I got to find a place. I, I need her. She's already stressing. She's, you know, not, you know, she has so much going on, you know, I'm thinking about my health, but I'm like thinking about Zena too, because I'm seeing the changes with her. Um, and I didn't know that. It's, it's, it's funny because I didn't really believe it. Like you get this attachment when you get an animal, but you don't, at first I was not that person. Dogs, oh, they're just a dog. It's just a dog. You know, I didn't realize how attached and how, you know, her, how she felt, you know, was affecting me. But um, you took her in and during that time I was just looking, looking and I found the place. So when you were like, hey, is that still the date? You know, you're picking her up. I was like, hey, we have a place. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just getting it ready and I was so excited getting it ready for her. And yeah. So I would love you to talk. You, you touched a, a second ago about some of the things that Zena was going through. And I think that that's something that 
you know, we don't think about all the time, right, is how your stress and your situation was affecting her and the things that you had to, tr to try to make her more comfortable. Can you talk a little bit about Zena and, and how her behavior was affected by what you went through and what things that you did to try to help with that? Yeah, so Zena's always been like spoiled between me and my daughter. Like she could do whatever. She was not like, we always said no jumping on the furniture. Zena jumps on the furniture, like whatever, you know, like, and we all, we, we let her do that, you know? Um, but it was when I, I think when we went there and then you were telling me that she was like doing the hand fighting. I was like, what do you mean? You know? And then you were saying like, you know, you think she's stressing, you know? And I'm like, huh? What do you mean? not stress, but she don't know stresses. And then when we came to see her, it was like, she was so happy, like, you know, to see us, like, are you taking me home? You know, um, when I got her back, I noticed a lot of things. I think at that time, um, they had prescribed her some medication, her anxiety. And I did know she had the anxiety um, issues because I know like, I don't know where it came from, but whenever we would do walks and things like that, she would be really jumpy, you know, get behind me, do this thing, get between my legs. And so I kind of knew it was there, but I didn't know how bad it was. Um, when I did get her back the first time, she would just stick to me. Like she, you know, I'm trying to play the ball. She just wanted to sit next to me. It was almost like she was like, no, I'm not leaving. You know, like she thought she was going to go again. I don't know. I can't, can't really explain the feeling, but it was just like, she would not leave my side, you know? So then when I would put her up, I would cry. She would cry, I'm crying, you know? And, I, this is, and let me go back and, and share for people who don't, um, don't know what I'm talking about. This is during the time I got her back the first time when I was staying with a friend, she was in the shed. So when I was time, I had to work, I had to put her back in there and she would cry. I would hear her whining and I would cry, you know? Cause I didn't want to hear that. Um, when she went back to the shelter, now that she's home, she's really has really bad separation anxiety. Um, I really cannot do anything without Zena, like being right under me, you know, and I'm seeing it. So I'm taking her out, you know, letting her see other people, hang around people, but it's like she's stuck to me. You know, we can be sitting on the chair. I can go walk to the kitchen. Zena's there. Go to the bathroom and it's like I'm tripping over her. Um, but it's almost like, you know, she feels like, I don't know if I'm gonna leave. I don't, I don't know, but it's it, it's kind of sad because sometimes it's like, go play, like, you know, you're a kid, go play. <laughs> but she like stuck to me. So right. But I love, I love the things that you're doing. So first of all, I want to say actually before I go into that, I I love that we're talking about her effects only not because of course I'm not happy that she went through separation anxiety and that she's going through that. That's very sad that she is, but we've spent a lot of time in this conference talking about how much people need animals. We haven't spent maybe as much time talking about how much our animals need their people. Yeah. And, and she needs you. And so, you know, we do have a picture. I did post a picture. So if you go to the photos, there's a wonderful picture of Marlene and her daughter with Zena when they came to visit the shelter and you can just see the joy on Zena's face. And it was like we were within a completely different dog um, and because she had her people with her. And so I think it's important to just note that it's not, it that as much as you mean, she means to you, you mean that to her as well. And so the things I know that you've tried you know, with her to make her more comfortable. I know you have a thunder vest for her and you've been, you know, getting her on Prozac and doing, you know, you have training that you're setting up for her. So like, I know, you know, I love the things like you're recognizing where she is yeah. and you're doing the things that you can do to make her feel more comfortable. And so I'm just, I'm just really impressed with that. And I just wanted to, to mention it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so I have so many notes. Um, one thing I would love to talk about that I mentioned this morning too, but maybe you can tell us about how you feel like your personal strengths and even your work as a social worker, how those things helped you through this process. I'm going to say 
I'm going to be real transparent here right now. And when I said that I had like a breakdown, I think that all that went out. It did. I felt like it was one of those things where I, I had already struggled with some things. I've always struggled with anxiety myself, um, depression, but it was one of those things I think where it, I was just tired. I, I was, I was tired. So even being a social worker, the things that I would share with my clients and coping skills, I couldn't like, it was, it was a struggle for me. Um, the person I'm going to say, you heard me mention my daughter. It wasn't just, the, it was my daughter who really helped me through it. Um, it was, and it was, the way she did it is like, it was two different ways style she had. It was one to where, you know, she was out trying to help me and do things and find me. So that kind of hurt me as a mom because, Hey, that's my job. So it tried, it made me want to be stronger. But then the other one, because of the relationship we have, she was like, well, I'm not going to baby you. You just need to get up and, and do it. <laughs> you know, she was like that in my face. And I appreciate it both ways because I needed, you know, it was both of those ways. But honestly, it was like, I was, it, this being a social worker, when it, trying to do it with yourself, it wasn't, it was totally. And it's like, I, I think I gained more of an understanding to be able to work with my clients. Now I work with children, but I work with their parents too. So I think this was where I was able to say, okay, you know, I can relate. So I think if anything is going to make me a better social worker. Yeah, for sure. I can definitely see that. Did you, did you reach out to any human service organizations during this process? And if so, what was your experience with that? I did not. That was the thing, you know, human services, you mean like for like assistance and things like that? Yeah, for for housing assistance, and and if so, so, so if you didn't, then then what? Why didn't you? It was more of a pride thing. Like I said, I'm 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 in the field. These are people that I run into, you know, when I'm working with kiddos and their families, and you know, things like that. I run into these people, so it was more of a pride. Even though I know that we all go through things, it was more of a pride, like having to go and these are my colleagues. Like I'm seeing these people, so I think it was more that than anything. Mm. It's hard, hard to be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, um, some of these I've already asked because I'm not going to order. Um, but what do you think, and this was a question from before earlier session, and I just think it's very appropriate. What could we be doing better? Animal services, human services, society, like what should we be doing to support people that we're not currently doing? From our one we had yesterday, I think listening and seeing what's really needed, you know. Um, it seems like, and I'm going to go back to me working with people. It seems like there's sometimes because I work with agencies, things out of my control, but there's things that these families need. And for some reason, they can't get it, whether it's, oh, you don't make the, uh, you make too much money you know, or it, it, well, you don't need this. You can go ahead and buy food. You know, we're not listening. We're not seeing, you know, what re needs to be done. We're, 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 I'm just going to say listening. We're not really listening to what people need, what they want. And, and, and it's sad, you know, um, I look at with me, there's times where I sit and I say, you know, Later on, um, things that I want to get into, like as far as different organizations I want to like attempt to create so that I can be assistance to others because I, I'm seeing they're not available. There's services that I feel that's needed, they're not available. So I, you know, often sit and, you know, when I can't sleep or do anything like that and jot things down of things that I want to do, you know, first step, you know, I'll get my license, but I want to definitely get and start, you know, developing programs, can I say, um, to where I can help others. Um, can you give an example of a specific gap 
Okay. So I, mean, I know you don't have your notes right in front of you. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Well, this one just off the thing, and this may be way off topic or what you're talking about, but okay. So I feel like sometimes we assume that people know what to do as far as living on their own, paying financially, things like that. When you asked me about being human services, I think I could have used them, utilized them and came out on top. You know what I'm saying? Like what I mean by that is that sometimes I think we give these assist, we give services to people, right? But we don't assist them with how to use them, if that makes sense. So what happens if you're giving a, 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 a family um, SNAP benefits, you know, housing, all these things here. And it's supposed to be temporary for them to get their stuff on, a feet, on their feet. But they just got out of a situation where they got into this trouble. So they never got the counseling or anything there. We're assuming that, oh, we're going to give them that and they can help themselves. But that's not it. They need, I feel like there need to be programs to help people, like to guide them, you know, um, training classes and things like that. If that kind of go to, if you understand where I'm going with that. Absolutely. I love that. I think that's wonderful. So you've already touched a little bit about your goals for the future and, and kind of what your plans are. And I'm so excited to, to that you have Zena with you and that she can be with you for that process of the things that you're going to be doing. Um, so I think that this is actually a really good time for me to switch over to see what comments and questions we have from other people. Um, so I just now went over there. Let's see. Well, first of all, a lot of people thanking you for your story, um, which is, is wonderful. So someone asked if there is something specifically that, or what, was there something that made you hesitate in asking the Humane Society for help again? Um, the second time, yeah, it was because I, I felt like they, they were awesome. Like they made this process so much, like it was like a, a stress, just like a light, like pulled off me. So it was like, I was lighter. Okay. I can think now, you know, because that was a relief, you know, so I safe and things like that. That was the first time. So the second time I was like, well, I don't want to keep asking and keep, you know, there's other people that need help. So it was more so like, I didn't want to keep bothering you guys. And I knew that there were other, you know, people. And I knew that even when you took Zeta in, it was like, you know, hey, we have a you know spot, you know, we don't have this much, but we have a spot opening. And I was so happy, but it was like, I felt bad because I was like, well, someone else needed. And I already had a, you know, like a time, you know, I kind of felt like that. I just didn't want to over, like, what's the word I want to do? Like, keep asking. I just didn't want to keep asking. And I just felt, yeah, it was just a part, it was a personal thing, how I felt, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want no, to. I'm, I'm glad that you did reach out again, though. No. And I, and I also do want to point out, like we did work with animal control on that. They did keep her for two days. And I loved too, that you were resourceful in that you asked, like when we determined like, yeah, we can take them, but we don't have the space quite yet. I just love that, you know, between all of us working together, we were able to make that happen. Someone yeah. asked, yeah, someone asked, how did Zena come into your life? <laughs> Zena came into my life. So this is to my day, my, to this day, my daughter denies this, but so because I'm in therapy, I was like, Hey, it would be cool to get a therapy dog. <laughs> so, but I feel bad. The dog that I wanted was a what it was like the doodle, I guess they are the labradoodles. Mm -hmm. I want a nice little labradoodle for you know the office. So I remember my daughter came home and she was like, um, I got a dog. I'm like, oh, okay. And she's like, oh, for your birthday. And I was like, okay. Zena's birthday, I guess she had been talking to the people. Zena's birthday was February 15th. Mine is February 16th. So when her friend had the puppies, you know, she's talked about them, paid and everything. So when it was ready, you know, she was telling me about it. So I think we brought Zena home around in April. <laughs> she brought her and I'm looking and I'm like, mm, that's not a therapy dog. <laughs> <laughs> she was like ma but I knew what she wanted because she always wanted a pit bull the thing is so it was like kind of her dog she picked and everything but it was funny because Zena attached to me like she would come to me you know and my daughter I would say they were my two kids because they would like fight they go back and forth I would hear Zena jumping on her bed or something and she's half asleep and you would hear her move you know and they're like back and forth it was so funny but yeah it was like Zena was her dog but she tried to say it was for me 
<laughs> and then <laughs> it tells me. So yeah. <laughs> So um, that's how that actually came. I mean, I, I laugh because I keep asking her and she's like, she she denies it. She was like, no, you said you wanted a therapy dog. I, said, I didn't say I wanted a pit bull for no therapy dog. <laughs> but look, now she I love this. her. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to ask, I think, one more question because we are running out of time. Um, so besides the fact of not having stable housing, was it hard to keep Zena because of the friends you were staying at with housing restrictions at the friend's residence? Although I think for you, it was more finding a place, but please expand upon that. Um, finding a, uh, where the breed restrictions came in as far as was it with the place that you were staying with your friend or was it, do you want to expand a bit on that? So it was more like, you know, while we're looking for apartments and then it was, you know, looking for apartments, looking for places for rent. Um, a lot of places that I was, that was perfect for us. I said, no dogs. And then when, so I went to, I would look at apartments because I was looking for a house first to rent. Then we have backyard and everything. So then when I started looking at apartments, it was breed restriction. And then I noticed like, okay, so the ones that didn't have the breed restriction, like those places are like outrageous. You know, they were looking like 1800 for a two bedroom. And I'm like, yeah, right. Um, it was that. So then even when I found my friend allowed me to stay with them, they kept saying, you know, dogs don't, big dogs don't come in a house. Big dogs are not supposed to be in a house. And I'm like, where did you get that from? <laughs> So, but I had to, I didn't know what else to do with Zena. And I, and I went back and forth with this. You were really great about giving and looking for, you know, suggestions and helping me with that process there. But it was more so just like the restriction. People really, pit bulls really have a bad rep. So, and I just want to, just want to let people know that what you ended up doing, which I love, which was so resourceful is you ended up looking for individual rooms and houses because you knew that you would be able to get around some of those restrictions that way. And so that even though it wasn't your ideal situation, that was a way that you were able to get around the breed restriction was by going through an individual who owned their own home versus through an apartment. Um, so I just think it's wonderful, first of all, for people to know that that is a way that you can sometimes make it work, but also I love how resourceful that you were in making that happen. I did forget about that. So thank you for sharing that part because that was it. I had to do the room, you know, and that is actually, it actually worked out better than I thought it would be, you know, because they all love Zeno. So she has like all these people walking and want to play with her. <laughs> that does work out well for her since we know she loves attention and being around people. <laughs> Okay, well, unfortunately, I do have to wrap up now um, because we're out of time. But I just want to thank you so much, Marlene, for so bravely sharing your story with our audience, and um, and just just thank you for for being here and sharing. Thank um, you.